Hi folks, welcome to this video. This is on VO2 Max and Obla. So two terms that you might be, or you should definitely be familiar with VO2 Max, Obla you might not have heard of before. Um, what is VO2 Max? Now the reason I'm starting with that is it's always good to know what we're talking about. But secondly, whenever you get a question on VO2 Max, be it an essay question, be it a three mark question, you must always define VO2 max. It's a bit like when we spoke about AS level gaseous exchange, how you should always give a definition of diffusion, as it's always going to guarantee you a mark. Exactly the same with VO2 max. So let's get a definition of VO2 max first. Okay, so there it is. That is the definition of VO2 max. So just make sure I emphasize that. The maximum volume of oxygen that can be taken in and used per minute. There's two key things that people forget to put every year when questions come up on this topic in the exam. They forget to mention that bit. It's VO2 max. You've got to say it's the maximum volume of oxygen that can be taken in and used. And the other thing they forget to put is per minute. Okay, that's what we've got to make sure we put. I tell people every year, read it backwards. Read VO2 max backwards. It's the maximum volume of oxygen, okay? It's the maximum volume of oxygen. All you've got to remember is that I can use per minute. What you've got here is a graph um, of VO2 max down at the bottom, right? Now, what we're seeing here, uh, if I just get an arrow out, these are two different people. As it says, athlete one is the red line, athlete two is the blue line. What happening is these two people are on a treadmill and... As you can see, they're increasing the running speed probably every two minutes, something like that. They'll bump it up by a mile an hour. Forget this LT, 16, 70%. We're going to deal with that later on. All we're looking at is the shape of the graph. As the speed increases, the amount of oxygen they're taking on board and using increases. As you'd expect, as you start to work more, you use more oxygen when you're jogging than what you do when you're sitting still. So as you work harder and harder and harder and harder, you start to consume more and more oxygen. What we're seeing at 11 miles an hour for both of them is they get to their peak amount of oxygen that they can use. When it gets to 12 miles an hour, it's dropped. When it drops, we know that they have been at their VO2 max. So for athlete one and athlete two, they were around about 60 for athlete one about 56, 57 for athlete two. So what we're seeing for athlete one is, as an example, is that um, if I put athlete one, they have a VO2 max of 60 milliliters. Oops. Change my pen. Per kilogram per minute. Now what that means is, Every kilo they weigh, every kilo of their mass is using 60 milliliters of oxygen per minute. Okay? Whereas athlete two is using around about, or has a VO2 max of 56 milliliters per kilogram per minute. That one's written a bit better. Apologies for the first one. So what we can see there is that athlete one has the higher VO2 max. They are the slightly better endurance athlete. Okay? The more endurance-based you are, the higher your VO2 max. Mo Farah, for example, has a VO2 max of at least 80, probably close to 90 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Um, why do we do it per kilogram per minute? We used to do it just milliliters or liters per minute, but don't forget, bigger people will have a bigger VO2 max because they have bigger lungs. If you just look at it in terms of liters per minute, by dividing it by body weight, by kilos, you allow it a better comparison, i.e. Mo Farah is a lot smaller than, let's say, Steve Redgrave. Now, if you just look at how many litres of oxygen they are using per minute, Steve Redgrave would have the higher VO2 max because he's the bigger man, he's got the bigger lungs, things like that. But if you divide it by body weight, by how many kilos they weigh, you'd see that Mo Farah had the higher VO2 max for every kilogram that he weighed. So it's just a way of standardising it to make sure we know what the VO2 max is for each individual athlete. Okay, so we'll make that quickly disappear. There's one other thing that we need to know about VO2 max, and this has been half an essay question before, and that is factors affecting VO2 max. What affects your VO2 max? What leads you to have a high or a low VO2 max? Now, there's a couple of things that you need to know about this. 
we can go and we do often go down the phys oops, physiological route, i.e. what is it about your physiology that leads you to have a high or a low VO2 max. But we also need to mention a few other things as well. What lifestyle factors affect your VO2 max? What role does genetics play? And what role does gender play in your VO2 max? So we're going to look at these one at a time. The big one is obviously the physiology. What factors will affect your VO2 max? Well, whether you have cardiac hypertrophy, have you got a big, strong heart or not? If you have, you have a high VO2 max, or you will have a high VO2 max. If you don't, you will have a low VO2 max. So also, what else affects it is your stroke volume. You know, if I have a big stroke volume, i.e. I have cardiac hypertrophy, therefore I will have a high VO2 max. So that's um, one as well. What else will affect your VO2 max? The amount or the volume of haemoglobin in my blood Haemoglobin carries oxygen. If I have more haemoglobin, I can carry more oxygen, therefore I will have a higher VO2 max. Okay, so that one's fairly straightforward. Linked in with that, myoglobin will also have an effect. How much myoglobin I have in my muscles, because if I can carry and hold more oxygen in my muscles, I will have a higher VO2 max, I will have a higher maximum volume of oxygen that I can use per minute. Equally, what I, you know, you can call it your capillary density. How many capillaries I have? Capillaries, remember, are the blood vessels that carry blood through things, through muscles, through organs. So if I have more capillaries, I can carry this hemoglobin rich blood through the muscles more effectively, drop off more oxygen, and the muscles can use more oxygen. Therefore, I will have a higher VO2 max. So they're some of the common ones. Um, that we can talk about in terms of physiology. Um, what I would say is that when you get a question on this, they will only ever award a maximum of four marks for physiological reasons that affect VO2 max. They're four of the common ones, okay? There are others as well, though, that will get you marks as well. It can be... Oops, I'll get rid of that, sorry, because I'm making a mess of what I've just written. It can be... Um, something that we're going to look at or if you're watching this as revision what you already know twitch fibres do you have fast or slow twitch muscle fibres slow twitch are for endurance athletes if I spent my life training for endurance for endurance events I've got a lot of slow twitch muscle fibres therefore I will have a higher VO2 max because that is my kind of event as well Okay, so they're all factors that affect your VO2 max Okay, right, let's move on to lifestyle. So what lifestyle factors affect VO2 max? Well, things like exercise levels. Do you do your five times 30 minutes a week or more? Are you actively trying to improve your VO2 max? Things like smoking. If I smoke, I will reduce my VO2 max because it's, destroying the alveoli in the capillaries in my lungs so I can't get oxygen into my system. It's worth a separate mark. Methods of training. If I am doing continuous interval or fat leg training, I will increase my VO2 max. If I am doing resistance, strength and plyometrics training, it is not going to increase my VO2 max. So not only is my exercise levels a factor, or are my exercise levels a factor, what I am doing during those exercise sessions is also a factor in terms of um, the size of my uh, VO2 max, okay? So they're the three key lifestyle factors that affect VO2 max. So if we now move on to genetics, this is dead straightforward, okay? We, or it's been shown that we can inherit VO2 max from parents. Okay? So, Mo Farah's kids, chances are, are going to have 
inherited the potential to have a high VO2 max, same as Paula Radcliffe's children. You know, if the parents have well-developed VO2 max max values, then the ch- the children have the possibility to develop. You're not naturally born with a high VO2 max, but you're born with the ability to develop a high VO2 max. And finally, gender. It's just one of those things, ladies, unfortunately, males generally have higher VO2 max values, basically due to size. Size of the rib cage, bigger rib cage, bigger lungs, bigger heart and lungs. So that's generally the issue there, okay? That's one of those things that can affect as well. There's one I've just quickly remembered that I've forgotten. Um, other things, it's, it's a lifestyle thing as well. So I'll come back to lifestyle and the yellow writing. Age. As you get older, your VO2 max gradually declines, as does all fitness components, as do all fitness parameters. So as you get older, your VO2 max values begin to fall. What you need to be able to do for the exam is explain them. Don't just say age affects VO2 max. It's as you get older, your VO2 max decreases with age. If you do increase exercise levels, you will increase your VO2 max. If you have increased hemoglobin, that will lead to a higher VO2 max. So for all these factors we've put down here, you've got to say in which way they affect VO2 max. That's that explain word. So let's finally move on to this one. Obla, onset of blood lactate accumulation, right? You need to know that. What does it basically mean? It means the point at which you start to build or accumulate, that's what accumulate means, lactic acid levels in your blood. So basically what we're talking about is when you start to use your lactic acid system, that is when you start to accumulate lactic acid. So when you might be jogging at a certain speed and you're working aerobically, then we suddenly increase the intensity and now you pass over into anaerobic activity. You burn all your, you use all your PC and then you're in your lactic acid system, you are at obla. As you can see on this graph, there's a little LT here. What does that mean? It is also known as, and you need to know this for the exam because they sometimes just put this in the question instead. It is also known as lactate threshold, i.e. the point at which I start to build lactic acid. And again, if you come back down to this graph, what you can see here, look at the blue line first, okay? This is a person before training. Now, what we mean there is before a six-month training program. So as we've got running speed here, and what we can see is they've put them on a treadmill, and they've gradually increased the running speeds, and what they've done every minute is taking a tiny blood prick uh, sample from the finger. So you jab your finger with a tiny little needle, a tiny drop of blood comes out, and they can measure the lactic acid levels in the blood. Now, as you can see, two, what we call millimoles of lactic acid, that is what you would expect a resting body to have. So you sat there now watching this video will have around about two millimoles of lactic acid in your blood. It's always in your blood but just at very, very low levels when you're at rest and you can't feel it, okay? So even when this person is increasing the running speed up to 10 kilometers an hour, lactic acid levels barely increase. However, what happens at 10 kilometers an hour is we then reach lactate threshold or obla. As speed continues to increase, lactic acid levels continue to rise. Now, as we've said, that is the point at which that has occurred. That is obla, that is onset of blood lactate accumulation. Okay, so round, so this athlete before training reached obla at 10 kilometers per hour, right? There's something else that you need to know as well. And I'm gonna change the color of my pen for this, just so I can make an emphasis of it. It's this point here, whoops. That is not called their lactate threshold, that is called their lactate tolerance. What does that mean? That is how much lactic acid they could cope with in their blood. If you notice, the graph doesn't go up anymore after that point. Why? They had to stop. They couldn't work any harder. By the time they got there, they couldn't maintain it anymore. The lactic acid levels were too high. So that's how much lactic acid they could tolerate. So if you read across, it's around about nine millimoles per litre. That's how much lactic acid they could tolerate. What we've done now 
is we've taken them on a six month training program. Okay, so what's changed? Well, let's show you what's changed. This same athlete, okay, is now the red line after a six month training program. They can now get to 11.8 kilometers an hour before they reach obla before they reach lactate threshold. So I can now run faster without building lactic acid in my blood and in my muscles. That's massive, that's huge. Before, imagine these were two different people and they were having a race against each other. This person, the blue line, has to run just below 10 kilometers an hour, otherwise they're gonna start building lactic acid if they were doing something like a half marathon. This person can run at about 11.7 kilometers an hour before they start producing lactic acid. So that person's gonna win every single time. So that's absolutely huge. But you'll also notice something else has changed at the other end of the graph, okay? What has changed? Well, let's just change the color here. That is now their lactate tolerance. And if we read across from there, what does it show? It shows this person can now cope with 10 milliliters of lactic acid per liter in their blood, whereas they could only cope with nine before, i.e. they can push into their pain barrier even more. They can cope with it. They can to they're not producing less, they're producing more lactic acid, but they're still working. So they can tolerate more lactic acid. And if you're something like a 400 meter runner coming down the home straight, where you are full of lactic acid, the one who can tolerate it most is gonna win. Now, as you know, what is the only substance that can get rid of lactic acid? It's oxygen. So that's why we look at VO2 max and OBLA together because there's a couple of key stats you need to be aware of, okay? So if I write on here, VO2 max and OBLA, what's the link between them? Well, the link between them is this. Someone who has a high VO2 max will reach lactate threshold or OBLA later. They will delay it. So what we can put there is high, let me underline that, high VO2 max will delay obla. You will start producing, sorry, you will start accumulating lactic acid at higher speeds. So that's good. Mo Farah, why is he so good? At that last two lap kick where he really increases the speed, it's because he's got a higher VO2 max than any of those other athletes out there because of his training regime, which means when they're building lactic acid, he's not. He's not accumulating it at the same rate. He, he will accumulate it a little bit later than them and that's what gives him the advantage coming down around those last two laps. There's two key statistics you need to know, okay? And this is important for you in terms of your events and your lifestyle. If you are untrained, you will reach Obla at 50% VO2 max. What does that mean? Remember, 100% VO2 max is you working flat out, the maximum you can work. So 50% VO2 max is you working to half of your capability. Now, an untrained person is going to start accumulating lactic acid when they're only working at half their maximum effort. Well, that's not great, is it? You're, not, you're going to start building lactic acid, that nasty substance, when you're only working at half, half maximum capacity. How does that compare to a trained athlete? Let's come to this side. A trained athlete, they will reach obla. at, I'm going to do another at, at, at least 75% VO2 max. That means you are not going to start building lactic acid until you are working at least three quarters of your maximum pace. So that's the absolute massive benefit of having a high VO2 max. Just think about that for a minute. What is VO2 max? The maximum volume of oxygen you can take on board and use per minute. Yes, you're using a lot of that oxygen to produce energy via the aerobic energy system. But what else are you using some of that oxygen for? To remove lactic acid as it is building up. Remember, lactic acid 
buffered with oxygen tends to glucose, glycogen, CO2H2O and protein as we looked at when we looked at the slow component of EPOC. So what we're saying is when you're exercising at these intensities, if you've got a low VO2 max, lactic acid will start accumulating early. If you've got a high VO2 max, it will start accumulating later on because I can actually start buffering some of the lactic acid earlier because of my extra oxygen I'm taking on board. Think about that. Have a watch of it as many times as you need to. Read the information in the book and use it to help you answer the questions and good luck with it, folks.